Thank you, Dr. Cook, uh, Dr. President Foley, Dr. Fulop, faculty marshals, distinguished faculty, Dr. Zergani and Fleming, and Mace Bearer Farkas for that introduction, for the invitation to speak here today, and for allowing me to participate in the procession. My talk this afternoon is largely an extended reflection on my experiences of your hospitality here as your guest. But this talk is not for those behind me <laughs> or for the faculty to my left and right so much as it is for those immediately before me. I hope you'll forgive me for thinking of and sharing as I begin the two times too many years ago that I sat where you sit when dinosaurs walked the earth. <laughs> I listened first as a new undergraduate at a small liberal arts college in the Midwest and then after graduation as a recruit in Paris Island, South Carolina on the 1st Battalion Squad Bay before the beginning of my boot camp training as a United States Marine. I received, oddly enough, the same message in essence at both places. Different as they were, each time I sat where you sit, and perhaps not surprisingly, though neither speaker in Chicago or Paris Island touched on movies or I'd seen or books I'd read or even used the word, maybe even thought of the idea of hospitality, uh, much of what I will say here will echo what I heard back then. At my college, a professor gave the aims of education address to incoming undergraduates. As he became quite famous in later years before his death, because of a book he wrote on the narrowness of the American mind, that talk is actually in print. And I was able to read recently what I had heard live back in 1979. <sighs> okay. I'm sad to say that I, I didn't remember hearing this talk even after having read it to myself. What I remember of that occasion was what he said at my college house after his formal presentation to the college as a whole when he spoke semi-privately to 30 of us in something of a question and answer session. He told us then without equivocation or adornment, lest we walk away confused, that we were quite literally idiots. <laughs> the Greek idios meaning private person or individual and also in the pejorative English sense of the word quite stupid in our conceits and self-importance. He hoped very much that reading the great books in that college's curriculum would transform us from our current state, little more than baboons in his estimation, to something like human beings. Not, not forgettable, that. I remember too that we resented his remarks very much, and sadly I think now that we resembled the primates of his description in our ignorance and arrogance. After graduating from college and marriage, I decided to fulfill something of a family tradition and join the Green Gun Club, also known as the United States Marine Corps. Having descended from the bus, standing on the yellow footprints, and having had my head shaved, the Marine Corps officer who spoke to me and my fellow recruits was much kinder in his remarks than my college professor, just before unleashing four drill instructors to remake us in Paris Island's crucible. He told us that he admired our courage for enlisting. He shared the thanks of a grateful nation for the choice we had made and for the sacrifices we would make in the next four months of training. He assured us that we would be treated with respect as America's finest young men. And he asked us to tell him if we were physically beaten, mentally tortured, or verbally abused at any time. Like the professor, though, he was obliged to tell us that it was a very good thing that we had come to that place for our transformation because, in his estimation, we would not be truly human until his experts had had their 15 weeks to remake us. Different as these locales and convocation speakers were superficially, they were both right about my need for a radical transformation and the value of the initiation and experience I was about to have if I would only endure to the end. Both speakers, it is no accident, were speaking to human animals of about the same age, mostly your age, legally adults, but thought of as young people at the beginning of their independent lives. It is no accident, of course, that college and military service begins at this age for the most part. The reason, I think, is that psychologically, our ideas of self, from community, family, church, education, sports, are at your age congealing into something whole, a distinct ego or persona. Before this self-identity from the arbitrary and almost infinitely various circumstances of our upbringing sets like concrete, and we become persons of historical accident, culture 
in the form of college or a screaming drill instructor, intervenes to break down this incipient ego and expand our ideas of self and what it means to be human. This remaking certainly works, as any jarhead will tell you, or any college graduate who thinks of his school as his second mother. It only works, alas, if this transformation is a conscious choice that you participate in actively and deliberately. It is in the hopes of waking you up to this necessary decision that colleges and basic training officers begin their work with convocations and addresses such as this one. Paris Island actually was a lot cooler than this, as I recall. Though I am grateful that you've air-conditioned this podium. That was a very thoughtful addition. Who would have thought? Anyway, you may be here because a conveyor belt brought you here, but you will only become human at the end of this experience if you embrace it now as your choice of a greater life. You have elected to join a community of learning and transformation formed by the Sisters of Mercy and informed by the four virtues of mercy naturally, service, justice, and hospitality. Without thinking too hard, I think we can see that each of these qualities is a different name describing the same thing, namely our capacity to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We are merciful to others in so much as we are mindful of our need for mercy ourselves from our judges, especially our God. We serve others not from a false humility one hopes, but from an understanding of our brotherhood and shared origin in the Lord. We pursue justice out of respect for others and expectation that we too will be treated fairly by others and in the knowledge that we too will be judged in the end. Hospitality though, th though it's like the other virtues in being largely absent from the world outside havens like this community, differs from service, mercy, and justice in not even receiving much lip service or celebration. We think of it as our grandmother's virtue, being kind or nice to guests, making sure they are fed generously, that they have clean towels in the bathroom, maybe even putting them up when they have no place else to go. The other virtues, forgive me, seem relatively heroic and global, something to celebrate in verse or in novel or to foster with a government program. Hospitality seems only the virtue of Motel 6 or the Holiday Inn in common understanding. And if anything, as with the virtue of obedience, I'm afraid is written off as a virtue in a dog and a failing akin to willing subjection in a person. This is a shame because like obedience, the love evident in true hospitality is the key to the other Sisters of Mercy virtues celebrated at the mountain and the foundation of authentic spiritual life. Hospitality reveals the human being you can become here through your studies and it helps, believe it or not, in understanding today's most popular stories. In brief, hospitality is the supernatural human capacity to love others, not only as ourselves, but also to honor them as we do God. Today I want to share my reflections on this virtue by discussing a story I know many of you have read and many more of you have seen as a movie, Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games. I think it offers us a picture of how inhospitable our world is the way to find a home or refuge in it, and how to be truly hospitable ourselves. To review briefly, Hunger Games is the story of Katniss Everdeen, a woman in her teens who lives in a dystopian North America. In this future world gone very bad called Panem, there is a capital to which 12 surrounding districts live in de facto slavery, each contributing a specific resource for the capital citizen's pleasure and use or abuse. Katniss lives in District 12, the smallest, least populated, and seemingly most backward region whose contribution is coal mined from the earth. It is presented as Appalachia in chains to the capital, a city surrounded by an electrified fence in which the miners and shopkeepers are all kept in various degrees of starvation and subservience. The capital, though, does not restrict its subjection of the district to economic and military shows of force. It insists that every year, each district sent a teenage boy and girl to fight the other tributes to the death in what are called the Hunger Games. These tributes are paraded in district-themed costumes, interviewed on television spectacles, and then placed in an arena, stockpiled with weapons 
for with them to murder one another and with dangers created by the games makers to make sure the games are good TV. Everyone in the Capitol watches for pleasure, a sadistic reality television, and everyone watches in the districts because they must as a form of their punishment. Katniss, though only a young woman, is the provider for her mother and sister in the scene because her father died in a mine explosion. She hunts and forages illegally in the forest outside the fence with her best friend Gail, a young man a year or two older whose father was killed in the same explosion. We meet them on the day of the reaping, the ceremony in which the Capitol chooses district tributes by lottery. Katniss's beloved younger sister Prim is chosen and Katniss, as the rules allow, volunteers to take her place. Peter Malark, the baker's son, is chosen as District 12's boy tribute. The first novel and the movie adaptation is the story of Peter and Katniss's experiences in the Capitol in arena in a fight to survive. This story is a wonderful combination of the ancient myth of Theseus, Shirley Jackson's short story, The Lottery, the Hogwarts saga, and the TV program Survivor. It is primarily, though, what is called dystopian fiction, which is to say a story set in the future but which offers a critique of the world we live in today. Katniss's Pan Am, its district slavery and decadent capital, is a miserable reality and a not so subtle caricature or cartoon depiction of our world's present failings. Suzanne Collins offers us a passage into experiencing the agonies of our time, a knowing beyond conscious understanding by creating a story with a likable heroine we care about who is struggling first just to feed her family and then to survive the horrors of the Hunger Games arena. Her world is inhospitable, to say the least. It denies her the ability to legally provide for her mother and sister, restricts her freedom of speech, of mobility and choice, and creates an existence in which individuals and families only look for their own survival and for any pathetic advantage. It's the world that you meet in, in A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. I mean, it's a nightmare existence. It's the, it, Katniss has no intention to marry or to have a family. Her world as it stands has taken from her the ability to think of a future with any, any love in it beyond the love of caring for her own. How is this future fictional world gone wrong a means to our experiencing the injustices and inequities of our own time? The dystopian genre, though set in a time apart for our own, is, like everything we read, experienced in our present tense, or more precisely, an eternal now of the imagination and heart. As with other classics of this kind of story, such as George Orwell's 1984, the author can safely criticize the madness of our time by giving it a setting seemingly apart from our own age, but which we have no choice but to enter into as ourselves. The Capitol and its citizens in Hunger Games, I think, is a depiction of ourselves. We are the citizens of the Capitol, well-to-do Americans who have rarely, if ever, missed a meal, to whom the rest of the world serves up its resources and skills while they live in relative poverty. The made-for-television entertainment savagery of the Hunger Games arena is a not very subtle cartoon sketch of our reality TV shows and relationship to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as the author has admitted. Just as Orwell depicted what he saw of the social injustice and socialist government gone mad in the United Kingdom in 1948, in 1984, so Collins is allowing us, alongside her despicable capital voyeurs, watching Katniss run her three arena gauntlets to see ourselves as those citizens and to sympathize with Katniss, with those subject to our military and economic power. I certainly do not believe that the Hunger Games trilogy and the movie are as popular as they are, though, because we are so grateful for Miss Collins' poking us hard in the eye with the sharp stick of political satire. Sharp as her stick is, and as hard as she does poke us with it. I think the reason we love this stories, these stories, beyond those movie viewers that did enjoy the show statistically as the fictional capital citizens do, because of the answer Katniss's story gives us to the problem of surviving, escaping, transcending, even changing an inhospitable world. Collins's answer to Katniss 
and by extension every person's problem, is in her allegorical depiction of our most important choice and the spiritual consequences of making the heroic right choice. To understand this, I have to note briefly what allegory or symbolism is and what it isn't. It isn't, praise God, retelling a real world story or history in the guise of a fictional setting with, that, with the important players renamed. Though some want and have wanted for many years to believe that the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter are allegories of the Second World War with Sauron and Voldemort as Hitler and Dumbledore's army and the Fellowship of the Ring as the victorious allies, if anything, it is more true that the history of World War II and its various black and white hats were acting out the same eternal story as Tolkien and Joanne Rowling have retold in their sub-creations. Allegory, properly understood, is not two lists side by side in a classroom quiz in which story figures and events correspond tit for tat with real world people and history. Allegory and symbolism instead are windows through which we can see supernatural realities and truths fleshed out, if you will, in characters and their stories that we can grasp imaginatively, even experience in so much as we enter into the story. The three most popular stories of the 21st century, the, the, you know, the, the epics of Generation Hex, as many of you are known, Harry Potter, Twilight, and The Hunger Games all feature a traditional allegorical element, namely a leading cast of three persons who are symbolic transparencies or windows for the three principal faculties of our souls. Ron, Hermione, and Harry, Jacob, Edward, and Bella, Gail, Katniss, and Peta are all what is called by literary geeks soul triptychs, which is to say three paneled icons of the soul's desiring, thinking, and loving capacities, what we call colloquially body, mind, and spirit. This three-part character story in which the soul's journey is told in the form of an adventure is nothing new. It is as old as the charioteer in Plato's Phaedrus. It's featured in the Brothers Karamazov, which many consider the greatest novel ever written. And it's something we can see in the three hobbits on Mount Doom in Tolkien's classic. We see them in Doc, Spock, and Kirk on Star Trek, and Han Solo, Princess Leia, and Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. These soul triptych stories work as well as they do because of what happens when we read. We read fiction. We suspend disbelief, meaning we turn off our critical faculties and, are in, and enter into the story imagining ourselves within it through the eye of the heart. In story with characters serving as stand-ins for the soul's most physical, rational, and spiritual capacities, we experience their relationships as the relationships of how these soul faculties are best aligned, that is, desires answering to will and mind, and both desires and will obedient to the directions to the heart or spirit. Hunger Games' principal characters are Gail, Katniss, and Peta. Gail and Katniss are almost brother and sister as they are described in the first book's opening chapters, and this relationship corresponds wonderfully with the body and soul pairing and allegory. We are all unions of body and soul, a psychosomatic unity joined seamlessly toes to nose. Gail and Katniss's lives in the semen forest are story depictions of the soul and body life that we all live in the fallen world. The inciting incident of the books is the reaping, another name for death, in which Katniss's sister Prim is chosen as tribute. The choice that Katniss makes there is the one of sacrificial love to save the life of a beloved sister. The soul in this story here is then separated from the body at death. And immediately, when she makes this sacrificial choice, Peta appears, the second District 12 tribute. We learn that he saved Katniss's life years before by sacrificially giving her bread from his family bakery when she was starving. Bread he had burnt intentionally and for which act of love he was beaten. Because his appearances are at Katniss's times of greatest need, because his name is assonant with both Peter Bread and St. Peter, because speech 
His word is his greatest power. And because he loves Katniss sacrificially and unconditionally, it is no stretch to see him as the spiritual aspect of our souls, the part Jesus of Nazareth always calls the heart. Peter plays the part of the light of the world that cometh into the world in every man as heart. The Hunger Games in this light is an allegory of the soul's journey from its identification with the body and its worldly view and preoccupations to a love for the heart and love which is Christ. Katniss is only victorious in her Hunger Games arena because of Peter's love and her very slow to realize and her growing ability to recognize and accept it as that person, as Gail puts it, that she cannot live without. Mercia Iliadi writes in his Sacred and Profane that in a secular culture, one in which God has been pushed to the periphery of the public square and of our thinking, that entertainments serve a mythic or religious function. They are our means, in other words, to get beyond our ego existence and transcend the individual selves behind the persona masks that we wear. Story in the shape of books that we read, TV programs and movies that we watch, or athletic dramas in big stadiums is the de facto religion of atheist America, our means of self-transcendence. My corollary to Iliadi's thesis is that the more profound a mythic or transcending experience that a story delivers, the more popular it will be. It is no accident, in other words, that the Hogwarts Twilight and Hunger Games sagas are suffused with traditional Christian symbolism, artistry, and meaning that deliver a salutary imaginative experience of the soul making heroic, correct choices. As I said when I began, the college professor and Marine Corps officer who spoke at the convocations before my initiations and transforming experiences when I was your age did not mention books I had read, and they did not say anything about hospitality. It would have been ironic, I think, for the Marine Corps officer to have said anything about hospitality. But perhaps if they had read The Hunger Games or seen the world as the inhospitable place that it has become 30 years later, they might have. You live in an inhospitable world. As you live in the capital rather than the districts, you do not suffer from physical so much as spiritual want. And your transformation in the higher education you are beginning is properly about finding a home, creating a refuge in an unloving world outside these walls. I believe that you are singularly and providentially blessed to have chosen to attend a college with a focus on the virtues embraced and incarnate in the Sisters of Mercy, especially hospitality. I hope you will take away from Katniss Everdeen's story a postmodern and powerful retelling of the Christian soul's journey to and choice to accept the love of Christ, the truth that your refuge in an inhospitable world the, the inexhaustible source of your hospitality offered to your neighbor, even to your enemy, is your acceptance of and identification with love himself. Thank you again for the honor of being invited to speak with you today, for the hospitality I have enjoyed, and for which the Mount is very well known. You, the incoming class, have my best wishes that your experiences here are much more pleasant, but just as transformative as mine were as a new college student and Marine recruit years ago. I welcome you to the crucible of higher education and invite you to embrace it consciously for your more thorough change and your much greater life in Christ.